Welcome to Accessibilities with Dr. D. M. Marquis. Hi, I am Dr. D. Janetti, and this is my co-host and service dog, Marquis. Marquis, high five. High five. And a boy. Marquis, say hi. Say hi. Oh. And a boy. And who is our special guest today? Our guest is Jeff Hull, our fabulous town manager. Okay, Marquis, lay down. Good job. So as you know, um, this show is to highlight and celebrate everyday lives of people with disabilities. There's a saying, if you see it, you can be it, but there's a real shortage of people with disabilities visible on the screen. By highlighting people with disabilities, I'm hoping that someone watching the show may say, I have that disability, and if he or she can do that, maybe I can do that too. As well, we also want to highlight organizations, businesses, and town departments to um, show their reasonable accommodations to their products and services. People with disabilities are the largest minority in the United States. And disability is a universal facet of the human experience. At some stage of their lives, disability will affect almost all members of society through birth, accident, natural disaster, illness, war, poverty, anyone can become disabled without regard to age, class, race, or gender. Disabilities can be physical, sensory, cognitive, or mental, and many are invisible. I promote disability identity as a culture of strength and pride, not shame or pity. I see disability as just another mode of functioning, another way to move through the world, instead of seeing disability as impairment. Life with a disability is a way of life, neither tragic nor devalued. In this view, there is far less reason for oppression, isolation, and discrimination. So today, my special guest is Jeff Hull, our fantastic town manager. Thank you, Jeff, for taking time to come and, and join us on our show today. Thank you for the invitation. So Jeff, you have been our town manager and previously our assistant town manager for your whole entire career. Uh, just about. Actually, I, I started work uh, in uh, 1983 in the town of Ayer, so I was there for about four years before coming to Wilmington. And then you were t assistant town manager for how long? Uh, 25 years. And, and you've been our town manager? Do you want to say for how long? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm dating myself, but uh, uh, eight, a little over eight, eight and a half years. So you and I have known each other for over 30 years. Yes. It, that's just absolutely. amazing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yep. We started out, you, you started as an assistant town manager at the same time that I, around the same time I, I came onto the commission on disabilities. It's around the same time that it started. Yeah, I mean, I remember, uh, so I came in eight, to Wilmington in 87, uh, and I think it was right around that time, shortly thereafter, that we first met, and uh, back at that time, Larry Curtis was involved, and, and others, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what's it like running a town? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, th there's just a wide variety of um, issues that, uh, that I deal with on any given, you know, day, anything from personnel issues, the budget, which we're really very involved in now, um, specific issues like uh, the process we're going through to uh, uh, look at a new senior center potentially in a town school admin building. Uh, there's just an, a, a lot of, a wide variety of issues. Uh, certainly all of the uh, issues associated with COVID of late and uh, working with our uh, health director, uh, Shelley Newhouse uh, talking about the ways to get the vaccine out to people. So it, it just is uh, quite a, um, a wide variety of issues. Do we have the vaccine here in Wilmington yet? No, well, uh, so we received um, 100 doses uh, right around February 1st and Shelley and her group were able to um, 
have the vaccines administered over at the Shriners Auditorium. Uh, the Shriners have been just incredibly generous to the town in many respects, but they, in this particular instance, uh, uh, allowed us to use their facility. And so it was, the uh, vaccine was uh, administered to those 75 and older, uh, and it went, went very well. Uh, unfortunately, we have not received any additional vaccine since that time, and it appears that the state is looking to go in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. Wow. So um, COVID must have affected your job enormously. One thing that I noticed is that um, you do meetings all um, hours of the day <laughs> and emailing all hours of the night and weekends. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, a year ago, um, if somebody had asked me about Zoom, I would have probably gone back to the days when I was a kid and there was a program, uh, <laughs> Zoom, uh, it was a Boston-based program and, you know, for, for kids. Uh, but I had no clue as to what Zoom from, you know, the program was until now it's, you know, it's an everyday uh, tool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it has affected things. Um, you know, in, in just so many different ways. Um, wh one of the things that's interesting, um, the town hall, uh, for example, as, as challenging as it is in terms of some of the limitations that exist with the town hall, uh, one of the features that, uh, and I can't imagine the architects would have ever conceived of this, uh, but the building as being a former school and a round building uh, with windows around the exterior, <laughs> uh, it is now a, a drive up. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, it, it's really worked out very well, even in the more inclement weather here. We obviously have to be careful about making sure the access areas are um, uh, available to people. But uh, people will go up to, whether it's my office or a rec office, um, there, there's a path that they can go to um, in the rec. It actually has a little doorbell you can ring to get someone's attention. And, your, you know, the services are done through the through the window, so to speak. <clears throat> and we've really been in that mode now uh, for a number of months uh, and expect to be probably for the next few months until uh, COVID hopefully dissipates. But um, I experienced that. I had to pick up something from your office and they said, okay, think of the town hall as a clock and the front door is mm -hmm. six o'clock and we're at four o'clock. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, that's right. Um, so, you know, we've, we've adapted. Uh, some of the departments, it's been much more, um, you know, challenging. Uh, the elderly services, for example, uh, Terry Marciello uh, is the director. And uh, as, as you know, um, one of the things, one of the real virtues of uh, the programs that she's offered over the years uh, are the, the ability for people to interact with one another. And <clears throat> the senior center has been really a, a real hot spot for activity, um, programs of all sorts for uh, elders. And unfortunately, because of COVID, the building is not open uh, to, uh, to elders. And you know, I know Terry has talked to me about the challenges of trying to uh, make sure people are remaining connected. Uh, they, right. they still offer some amount of programs. Everything is uh, pretty much virtual at this point, but there are a few limited um, uh, programs and then the home delivered meals continue, but just maintaining those connections is yeah. just so important. It is. That's so important for everybody, but especially for our elderly who can't even just like go outside for a little while and then, you know, get a change of scenery. Right. Um, it's difficult. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I think this town is very special. Um, I became disabled in the 80s and back then we didn't have the American with Disabilities Act but we did have the architectural access laws and with those laws um, certain government buildings had to be accessible only in places where the public was uh, where it was open to the public so if somebody wanted to work there and the offices were outside of the public area, they didn't have to be accessible. So there was quite a bit of discrimination. So back then, it, most people thought of 
accessibility as front doors and parking lots, mm. but it's really, really grown since then. Um, but what I liked is when we first started, um, when Larry and I approached the town about uh, making areas accessible, the town was so open to, wow, you know, we didn't think about that, that it's not accessible to people with disabilities and what can we do to help? So um, the town's always been very active in trying to be accessible to all people with disabilities. Well, yeah, I think it's, it's certainly, um, it goes both ways. So, you know, the, the um, w one of the things that uh, I think sometimes challenging is for, uh, for people to necessarily think about all the potential um, issues that need to be considered uh, for people of varying abilities. And they're not always just structural. Sometimes those are uh, sometimes the easier ones to deal with because they're visible, whether it's changing outdoors or, or creating um, ramps on sidewalks. I think sometimes um, the, the ones that are more challenging to deal with are the, the institutional ones, whether it's programmatic or from an employment standpoint, making sure we're providing uh, access to people of all abilities in those venues. And, and one of the things I've certainly appreciated in working with you and Larry and others uh, on the uh, commission is the uh, willingness to work with us in a cooperative manner. Right, we took the approach, not that, okay, this is the law and you have to abide for it and we demand access now, we took the approach that, okay, it's not accessible, it's kind of expensive to uh, make things accessible, so what is a reasonable accommodation? So that's, that's kind of, that was our attitude right from the very beginning and we continue that attitude. And, and also with complaints um, to violations of the law, you know, my approach is not to, the post office, for example, just shoveled all their snow and put it all in the handicapped parking spot. Mm -hmm. So we had a resident that complained because not only could he not park in the parking spot, he wasn't in a wheelchair, which people think, you know, it's for people in wheelchairs. He walks with a walker and the aisle to the outside mailbox wasn't wide enough either for him. He felt like he was gonna fall so he couldn't use the post office. So um, instead of just going down there and say, hey, you violated the law, you know, go fix that right away. I went down and I introduced myself and I said, you know, here's the handicapped spot, here's the problem. And they said, oh, you know what? We never even thought about that. So mm -hmm. they apologized that the snow was there and said they'd take care of it. Um, that was a week ago. I don't know if they've done that yet, so I had to follow up. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, instead of just filing a complaint with the Massachusetts Office on Disability and ranting and raving, we want to help people. We want to encourage people to be accessible and just understand why so we can be, you know, open for all people with disabilities. Right. I think it's far more effective to be to take that approach um, because people will be more receptive to trying to make the changes. I think you know, by and large, people, uh, whether it's employers or businesses of any sort, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think for the most part people, um, you know, create barriers intentionally. I think in many cases uh, we're blind to them sometimes. Right. Right. Right, until, you know, until there was this awareness. So when the, when the um, ADA came along in 1990, um, not only did that open up accessibility, physical access to whole entire buildings, whether it was open to the public or whether it was for people to be employed, but now it also, uh, it was just it, not only government buildings, it was also uh, private buildings as well, private businesses. And um, we had physical access and then we had things like, oh, so we did a, we did a, um, uh, a community access monitor training at the mm, town mm -hmm. hall right. at the end of the uh, 1980s when uh, the town hall thought it had done a, a bit of access for us. Right. <laughs> and we found out that there were a lot of things that yeah. needed changing. <laughs> yes. So. Some of those things were um, 
the counters in the offices where people go, like to pay your taxes, the counters were too high for people in wheelchairs. And so what they used to do is they used to have us go to a room in the front of the town hall in the small conference room mm -hmm. and wait for somebody to come down and bring us what we needed. So there was segregation going on mm -hmm. there. So that was one of the types of things. And another thing that, um, that we found out was um, signage. Signage for people who are blind or um, signs being in the way. It turns out that people walking with a blind cane, if signs were sticking out, wouldn't know that there was a protrusion. So the law included things like that. So that it had to be something to let people with a cane know that something was sticking out of the wall. Water fountains, telephones, mm -hmm. signs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it continues to be a work in progress. Uh, certainly we've made strides. I think there's more that needs to be done, um, you know, from a physical standpoint in terms of the various buildings. Um, you know, the town hall uh, was built in 1959. Um, you know, at that time, uh, the, the requirements for physical construction aren't, weren't what they are today. And, and so we have made some modifications and, you know, I think modifications still um, need to be um, addressed there. And, and certainly the newer buildings, the uh, high school, which was completed in 2015, uh, is compliant as far as I know with respect to the various uh, ADA and uh, building uh, requirements. Uh, the middle school, which was uh, 2000, um, and the public safety building, uh, you know, the newer buildings, I think, are in much better uh, shape from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things we did in 1993, um, we um, opened up a chapter of the ADA Committee, the National uh, Americans with Disabilities Act um, Committee. And um, let's see who was. This is a long time ago. <laughs> there was you, Larry Curtis, myself, Roger Lassard, Cleo Fredette and Joe Devereaux from Special Needs, uh, Frank Boddy from the Wilmington mm -hmm. Commission on Disabilities, and Tina Stewart, the director of the library. And what we did, I thought that when I was thinking back, I was thinking, oh, that must have been a huge group. It wasn't, it was just us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what we did was um, we, we implemented um, a, a survey that surveyed every town department for the physical location, and they all had to uh, assess whether they were accessible or not, and not just physically, but uh, their programs and services. So now was the time that we learned that um, if a person was blind, you have to be able to offer information that's op available for the public, either in Braille or large print or an mm -hmm. audio tapes, an alternate format for them. Um, and, and then um, departments had to be open to um, making their areas accessible. I remember the rec department was one of our toughest issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they said, oh, we don't have anybody with disabilities asking to join our program, so mm -hmm. we don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I think that certainly that uh, mindset has changed. It's not about who you know, uh, but the programs have to be available uh, because there are certainly people of all abilities that want to join a program and, and so we have to be prepared to accommodate that. Right, and so as soon as the information was available to everybody, lo and behold, lots of people with different disabilities we're, we're joining in right. to the different programs. And then on the flyer, the um, rec department included, you know, um, if you need reasonable accommodation, call and ask. So then right. they started doing things like, like finding out where they could get a wheelchair accessible bus yes. to go on bus trips and things like that. Yeah, and even uh, to the point there's a, um, a program uh, for uh, actually locally um, um, originated uh, TOPS program. Uh, kids are involved in playing basketball and it's uh, for kids of varying abilities in, in the rec department. While we don't run that ourselves, we uh, really champion that program 
and make it, you know, market it, so to speak, for uh, families that may want to take advantage of that. So there's programs like that that we uh, try to uh, get the word out. That's great. That's really great. So let's see, what else have we done? Um, and then another thing that we, they, we had to do was all town employees had to be made aware of policies and procedures to address um, people with disabilities. So they had to learn what alternate formats and things like that were so that they could be able to um, let any residents know what types of services were available to help them have the same Accom to have reasonable accommodations to the same services. Right, that's right. Yeah. So let's see. Um, another another project we did was the town beach in the in the town pier. Yeah. The fishing pier. That's right. Um, the fishing pier. Uh, there's um, uh, access there for uh, people um, of all um, you know abilities in terms of physical abilities. Uh, the um, the beach area, uh, we, we purchased uh, um, these kind of tread-like uh, interlinking uh, tread systems, so mats, uh, mats yes, so that uh, people in uh, wheelchairs are able to access the beach as would anybody else. And, and the thing about that is once something's accessible for people in wheelchairs, all of a sudden other people realize Mothers with carriages yeah, can now right. wheel their children. People okay. with their equipment that they want to bring down to the water can yes. wheel it down there. Other people who have um, walking difficulties could walk better on, on those mats than on the sand. So it really opened it up. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like the uh, adage, you know, if you build it, they will come, right? I mean, exactly. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, so right now the um, Open Space and Planning Commission is going through their five-year plan and they've asked us at the um, Commission on Disabilities um, to look at, at their plans because not everything is accessible. Right. So um, there's actually 23 uh, parks and trails in town, which I found amazing. I didn't realize there were so many. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I, w one of the things that I find the, the most, uh, or that I enjoy in my off time, uh, so to speak, is taking advantage of some of those places. Like, uh, for example, the town forest. Um, there's a great network of trails up there for hiking, or I've taken my bike up there on a few occasions. The Sawmill Brook area uh, over on, off of Chestnut Street. Uh, again, some trail systems there, and um, it's just you know it's it interesting, and in, because you can feel like you're you're just in a totally different place uh, because it's so forested, and uh, so certainly those places, to the extent that we can make those available to the variety, wide variety of folks, that's that's a plan. Yeah, yeah. So um, I took the commissioners, most of them to a, um, a training several years ago. So most of us are now certified community access monitors for the state of Massachusetts. So we'll be going over those plans and, and doing access surveys um, on those areas and making recommendations for um, how they can be um, or what needs to become more accessible. Mm -hmm. But. Um, in, in the respect of, of being reasonable, um, not all trails um, are easily uh, made accessible. Right. So when, you, when you're doing an access survey, some of the things that you have to look at is, what is the ground made out of? Is it dirt? Is it pavement? Are there ruts? Are there tree stumps? You know, anything in the way? Can a person, and you have to think about not only a person in a wheelchair, but a blind person walking with a cane, right. you know, um, a person who has a limp, you know, any type of person walking, what what could possibly get in the way? Uh, so that's. But um, since we have so many trails, not everything has to be accessible. But what they need to do is somehow publish or put signage up there so people can know which trails are accessible mm -hmm. and which are not. Um, so signage was another another uh, area that we worked on. 
way back in the day. Yes, that's right. We got a machine so that that um, signs could be made in Braille. Yes, do you that? I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, public buildings, in fact, uh, uh, George Hooper is currently the public building superintendent, took over for Roger Lassard, but that's right, I recall that. Yeah, so I don't know, I don't know if um, they've kept up with the signage. That's one thing that I'll be checking on in the, yes. and I don't think that that carried over to the parks and the open spaces. No, I, I do think we need to address signage in that, in that area, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so, um, all right, so um, anything else that you'd like to add? No, I appreciate, again, appreciate the uh, opportunity. I know the uh, committee has become very active in the last uh, few years. There was a stretch where, um, you know, I guess due to other commitments, volunteers uh, uh, left uh, the committee, but it's good to see that uh, the group is back meeting on a regular basis and you know, we really appreciate the input that uh, the group is able to offer us and uh, kind of open our eyes a bit more in terms of what we need to be doing. Yeah, we, we were very active and very busy for many, many years. And then once we went through all of the assessments of all of the town departments and programs and services, it, there wasn't that much to do. We didn't have mm -hmm. as many complaints. And so it did, it kind of died down for a while. So now it is built back up. We have um, six people on the commission, and um, and it's it's great to be busy again. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you, Jeff. It's been really great having you. Um, so now um, today I have two inspirational, notable quotables. They're both from anonymous. The first is, "Life is not about being rich, being popular, being highly educated, or being perfect." It is about being real, being humble, and being kind. Just like our town manager. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and the second quote I have for today is, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. So thank you for viewing. If you happen to be a person with a disability or know someone who has a story to tell, we'd love to have you as a guest on our show. You can view our show on WCTV um, Sundays at 6 on Comcast Channel 99, Verizon Channel 39. We are also on YouTube. You can look us up by Access Abilities, all one word, no space. Um, and click on the icon of the Statue of Liberty seated in a wheelchair. And our latest um, way to view us is now on Facebook. You can find us on facebook.com reverse slash accessabilities2020. Um, you can like us, you can friend us, you can follow us, and you can also leave comments either on YouTube or on uh, Facebook. We'd love to hear your comments or questions and you can also email us if you'd like to be on the show at accessabilities2020 at gmail.com. So thank you for viewing. My key up, up, yep, up, that a boy. <laughs> My key, say bye, say bye. <coughs> Yay, thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>